Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hey, my name is Hannah Connor, and thank you for watching Postscript. I'm here with Ben Stewart. He's just preached a message on, has the Bible been corrupted? We've got a ton of questions, so let's go right. ahead and jump into them. Come on. First one, um, in light of what we've just heard, the question we got over and over is, which version of the Bible is best? Which do you use and like? Yeah, um, well, I would say translation other than version, you know, just to be precise about it, just uh, because we're translating the text. It's not someone kind of coming up with their own version of it, but um, the question becomes, uh, there's a scale of um, what they call on one end dynamic equivalence and on one end word for word. So like word for word translations try to take every Greek word as much as you can and put that word in English, mm -hmm. but that can make it kind of wooden sometimes. Dynamic equivalent tries to grab thought for thought. Mm -hmm. So they'll translate a passage and go, what's that basically saying in English and bring it across? Neither are bad. Um, so on that spectrum, like the message would be way over on dynamic equivalence. They don't even call it a translation, he calls it a paraphrase, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, I like reading like the message is great or the voice. Those are cool just kind of for reading. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm doing real studying, my preference would be the ESV, English Standard Version, mm -hmm. or the New American Standard, NAS, or the NET version, although the NET's pretty wooden. So ESV, NAS, but then I also like the, the NIV stands probably right in the middle. So the NIV is really good as well. Um, and so any of those would be great. And I think you could grab all those. So for me, I, I read them all. Mm -hmm. And because usually it's people trying to find different English words to help bring across the mm -hmm. Greek or Hebrew word. And that helps you understand it. So yeah. those are all great. It's good. Yeah. Uh, that's such a big deal to so many of us. How do we navigate the differences on that? Is that something like this is my, the hill that I die on? About a translation? Or no, I mean, I, I think it's, um, you know, again, sometimes it's helpful to read something like, I, like I remember for me, um, trying to really study every word of the Bible. I'm like, I need a, a version that's really going for that. So the the net, the New English translation, has a lot of textual notes, and I need that. But sometimes when you want to just sit and read poetry, the the NIV will grab the poetry of mm -hmm. Psalms better. You know, so it's about purpose. Yeah, exactly. That's a great way to say that, Hannah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I, I don't know that you have to say, well, there's just it's this one and the rest are garbage. You go, no, no, no. There's a lot of them that different scholars got in the room and did them. So NIV, NAS, ESV. I think those are great. New King James is good too. Uh, so I don't know that there needs to be a war about those. Uh, per truthfully, yeah. Um. <clears throat> We got a lot of questions from people who were clearly feeling like, man, I don't, hearing this makes me feel like I need to know more. I need to go deeper. Questions about canon. A lot of things we might not be able to get into in this time. Can yeah. you give us some resources? Yeah. Well, Daniel B. Wallace is, if you're more into like the language and how was the language translated, he's written books about textual transmission, kind of what I just did. Mm -hmm. So you can go to Amazon, type in his name. You can go to danielbwallace.com. You can go to the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. I think it's csntm.org. Okay. Like that. And uh, for more history questions, like mm -hmm. what, why did these books make it into the Bible, why these didn't, that's not necessarily like a translation issue. That's more like what happened in history. Mm -hmm. So like... Uh, uh, Justo Gonzalez's book, The Story of Christianity, would help you with that. Or um, even a systematic theology book could help you with that too, like Wayne Grudem's book. Uh, he'll have a section on bibliology, the study of the Bible. So I would try Wayne Grudem's systematic or Justo Gonzalez's Story of Christianity. Great. And just dive in, man. <laughs> Those will be great. Yeah. So if you just chew that up and spit it out, come, come on, back to you for go more. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about some of the more meaningful and viable difference between these an ancient texts. You alluded to that in your sermon a bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, totally. It's, it's, um, there's a handful, like I said, 1%. And the two biggest, I mean, biggest in terms of like size, number of words, would be 
what's often called the longer ending of Mark, mm -hmm. and then that passage in John 7 about the woman caught in adultery. Right. And so a lot of English translations, like if you looked now in your Bible, it would say the earliest and most reliable transcripts do not include blah, 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 mm -hmm. you know? And so scholars for honestly over, well over a century, from conservative to liberal scholars have looked at those and looked at, there's a First John 5, we don't even put in English Bibles, mm -hmm. because those three people look and say, these were not a part of the original Gospels. Mm -hmm. They weren't. The, the longer ending of Mark is, you can tell when you read it, kind of a pulling of other Gospels. Mm -hmm. And so none of our earliest, most reliable manuscripts have that one. I think that really was people trying to, because if you think about when the early books of the Bible were passed around, you weren't necessarily given them all. And so if you were just handed Mark, Mark ends with a big cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. And so you would have them in ancient documents, even like spaced out towards the bottom, mm -hmm. someone would write a brief ending. The women did go tell everybody and it worked out great, mm -hmm. but they weren't necessarily saying, oh, I'm gonna sneak in this inspired portion. And so that's why I think biblical scholars are saying, no, that part's not, Mark didn't write that. Mm -hmm. The woman caught in adultery, that one has a lot longer history. Like that document, that story is very old, mm -hmm. but historically it was not stuck where it is in John. And so that really occupies its own space of people wanting to hold on to that story or that moment, mm -hmm. but go, but it, it's not in mm -hmm. the four. And so even some old, um, copyists of the Bible would put it like in the margin of going like, we don't want to, we want you to know this story, but we don't know where to put, like it doesn't go here. Yeah. So let's write it over here. Mm -hmm. And then people are like, ah, it's so great. Let's stick it in. But scholars from the, from, from very early on have said, this was not originally where you see it in John. So my personal view, those should be pulled out because I think it confuses people. So I don't teach the longer ending of Mark because I don't, cause I'm with the vast majority of New Testament scholars, Mark didn't write it. Uh, there's other little bitty ones, but they're really small, but it's interesting, like uh, Bart Ehrman in his book will, uh, he co-wrote with his mentor, I pulled it out, if you really have trouble sleeping at night, you can read the text of the New Testament by Metzger and Ehrman. Um, it is painstaking detail. Metzger, Ehrman's um, mentor, mm -hmm. um, you can read his testimony in Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It was interesting when Bart Ehrman's book came out, a writer in the Washington Post said, this guy peered so deeply into the ancient uh, copies of the New Testament until he saw that they were false. So the assumption there is if you really study this seriously, you'll realize it's not true. Mm -hmm. But that was like some journalist saying that yeah. in Washington. Metzger was interviewed by Strobel and he said, you've been peering into the depths of this. Has this weakened your faith? And he says, no, it's strengthened it. He said, it's remarkable what you run into when you start really running into this. So Ehrman's doubts, I don't think are really at the root of them, and I'm not his counselor, but rooted in textual issues. Mm -hmm. They're rooted in, I think, some deeper um, difficulties in his life. But in his book, he'll mention some of these as real bombshells, mm -hmm. but they're really not. Mm -hmm. So like in Mark 1, there's debate on does it say Jesus became angry? Is the word angry in there? Mm -hmm. And Ehrman, his, his book will say, that changes your whole view of Jesus. Mm -hmm. is, was Jesus an angry man? That's what he wrote in his book. And you're like, well, multiple times in Mark 3, Mark 10, Jesus is called angry. Mm -hmm. So Jesus gets angry all through Mark. So whether the word angry is in Mark 1 or not doesn't affect our view of Jesus at all. Mm -hmm. Or one of the big ones he'll camp in on is Matthew 24, where Jesus says, no one, not the angels, nor the Son of Man knows when the end will come. Several translations of Matthew stick in, nor the Son of Man, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not in the most reliable ones of Matthew. And Ehrman mentions it half a dozen times in his book of saying, um, oh my gosh, so does he or does he not know when the end will come? This completely changes our picture of Jesus. And you're like, well, if you read Mark, there's no textual debate over the fact that Jesus absolutely says mm -hmm. the Son of Man doesn't know when the end will come. But Ehrman never mentions that Mark passage, which that's basic Bible study. Why? Because it doesn't support his thesis. Mm -hmm. So that's why, like, I, I pray for him. I want good for him in life. But I get frustrated because he's been called on that. It's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not good scholarship to do that. Right. 
uh, and uh, so it's frustrating to me. But uh, I agree with his mentor and Metzger's other protégés like Dan Wallace that the more you study this, the more you see it's absolutely remarkable uh, how well this has been preserved. So those are some of your biggest ones with a bunch of me just rambling in it, but there you go. No, that's good. Yeah. That's really helpful. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I think what would also be helpful is if you can give us some guidance on like, how do we enter into conversations like this productively? Like what should our goal be when we're talking to a brother or sister in Christ about this kind of minutia of the faith or an unbeliever? Yeah, I think it's hard to hold all this in your mind. Mm -hmm. So some people do that. They're like, oh my gosh, I got to have all this loaded up. So the next time my friend right. goes, well, how do you even know that's Jesus? And they're like, oh, uh, Tischendorf and Fourth Saint Anna. Or like, it's very hard to hold all that in your mind. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you have to. I think if someone says to you, well, how do you even know you have what was written back mm -hmm. then? Um, what I would do is just not get angry. You would just say, you know what, man? There's some people who've, you would be amazed if you scratch the surface, how deep the scholarship goes. Mm -hmm. Daryl Bach and Daniel Wallace wrote a book, Dethroning Jesus, which talks a lot about these modern questions people are asking. Mm -hmm. I would say, hey, you need to check out Daniel Wallace's book, Dethroning Jesus, because it's going to answer your questions. But then I would spin it back to them of going, I want to challenge you. Like, no one changed history more than Jesus Christ. He claimed he was God. A third of the planet says they agree with that. You got to deal with that man. And if you're wondering, well, does this an accurate presentation of him or not? Do you think that's worth reading a book about? Like this guy changed history. Everyone will say more than any other human being. I really want to challenge you, man. You need to go on a journey to figure out who this guy is. Like don't, don't miss that opportunity. And so that's what I would put it on them because what happened with a lot of people is they say, no, I don't want to. And you go, okay, the issue isn't textual reliability. Right. The issue is I don't want anyone telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. But see, now you've made it about the heart issue mm -hmm. rather than being on the defensive about 11th century documents. You're like, There's great books they can read about that mm -hmm. if they want to. Right. But I would keep trying to steer the conversation back to the person of Jesus. He's the center point of history. And he's all that matters at the end of the day is what are you doing with this man? And so when someone tells me, well, I don't know if we have an accurate presentation of him. To me, that's just, that's translation for, I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, and you're like, okay, so I'm not mad at you. But you're like, hey, man, yeah. uh, I would challenge you to go on a journey because I think you'll be surprised what you find. And a lot of people, when they go on that journey, they find far more than they expected. And like C.S. Lewis, they're surprised by joy. So that's, that's where I would go. That's great. Yeah. Bring it back to Jesus every time. Come on. There All it right. is. Well, thanks for sticking around, Ben. Thanks for watching. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.